Was the hollow earth theory proved this week? And then we take a look at the mystery of Pauline Picard. A young French girl who went missing, was found, and then found again. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. Just a quick update to a story we did a couple days ago, I think it was last week, where we were talking about conspiracy theories. Basically, YouTube is going to stop recommending conspiracy theory videos and things like that. It'll have a, a minor impact on this channel. I do get flagged for talking about stuff. Even though I'm disputing certain conspiracy theories, the algorithm doesn't pick up on that. They just hear that I'm using those words. And in that little segment, I was talking about what is a conspiracy theory? When I was talking to my friend Mitchum, we started talking about anti-vaxxers. At what point does that become a conspiracy theory where YouTube is going to start not recommending those videos? And he said, yeah, at what point does something go from being a quack medical practice to a conspiracy theory? Well, I just saw an article the other day where Facebook is actually going to stop recommending or they're looking at the option of stop recommending groups and pages that talk about the dangers of vaccinations. Representative Adam Schiff wrote a letter to Facebook and Google saying that we're having real problems with measles outbreaks and it's on you guys to stop promoting this stuff. So again, I mean, this is where this is going. I'm personally not an anti-vaxxer. I understand a lot of people have concerns about the vaccine and they wish that it was broken up into three separate vaccines. So I get it. I don't have kids. It's kind of an issue that I really haven't looked into that much because I'm like, I don't have kids. I don't have to worry about it. People believe this. People believe that. It doesn't affect me. But it's the slippery slope because my my example was the Mueller investigation. If Mueller doesn't find any proof that Trump colluded, d- does that mean everything, all the podcasts talking about Russian collusion, all the YouTube videos about Russian collusion, all of the Facebook pages, are those going to not get recommended anymore? At what point, stuff like the keto diet, could people say that's quack medicine? It doesn't work. Like, at what point do the companies have to say, listen, we can't censor everything that's not mainstream? So, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Because really, at a certain point, there's conspiracy theories about everything. I think the, the thing comes down to the opponents or proponents of a particular conspiracy theory. How powerful are they? Because they could say, no, 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 this isn't, is climate change a conspiracy theory? Is denying climate change a conspiracy theory? All of these issues will have to be handled in the next, really, and probably in the next couple of months. Uh, the Facebook and Google and all that stuff leading up to the next election are going to have a lot of pressure on them to shut this stuff down in one way or the other. So we'll see. We'll keep covering the story. I think it's going to develop very interestingly. But we had some amazing news this week. And it really gives hope. To the weirdos. Hope to the weirdos like me. And we're going to specifically be talking about Hollow Earth. Now, so the idea when people use the term Hollow Earth is generally that the Earth itself is hollow. That there's just an outward crust. And then inside there's a bunch of like spaceships flying around and octopus people and eight foot tall mummies dancing and all that stuff. And I think that's kind of the perception and I think that's kind of misleading. Now that may have been the idea of what Hollow Earth was in the 1700s. But when I've talked about stuff like vast cave systems, and I don't generally use the term hollow earth because a lot of people think, well, there's not a giant hole in the earth that you can fall into and meet like Mumra flying around ships powered by Vril. I don't believe in any of that. But I believe that deep, deep under the earth, there are vast caverns and cave big enough for whole societies to live in. I believe that. What we think, I don't, I never really bought the idea that the earth was a solid ball. I believe that deep in the earth, you would have huge open stretches. And I'm talking deep, deep, deep under the earth. Hundreds of miles. You'd have these vast cavern systems. Whether or not those are accessible to us, I don't know. But I never really, I always thought, well, how do we really know what the earth is made of? The scientific idea, and it's funny because I, in preparation for the story, I went to the Wikipedia article about hollow earth. And talking about the scientific debunking and stuff like that, they said, nope, the Earth is completely solid. You have the upper mantle and the lower mantle and the molten core and the crust, delicious jelly-filled donut that we call planet Earth, except instead of jelly, it's hot lava. But so what happened in 1994, 
there was a massive earthquake, the second strongest earthquake on record. And it wasn't just like, a, oh, you know, stuff shaking around. It was a earthquake. The whole earth shook during this event. And a bunch of nerds have been pouring over the results for the past, I don't know, what would that be? 15? No, that'd be like 25 years, maybe. So this earthquake happened when I was in high school, graduating year. Happened the year after Kurt Cobain died. Maybe it was his ghost floating around, shaking stuff up like he did with the music industry. <laughs> but anyways, so in 1994, the Shine earthquake happened. They've been pouring over the results ever since. Now, last week, Valentine's week, it was a love letter to, like I said, all the weirdos out there. And I'm including myself in that definition. The report was released and they're saying, hmm, well, we can measure the seismic waves because this earthquake, it's kind of bounces around in the core and moves from one end of the Earth to the other. They said, based on the seismic waves and the way they moved through this, through the planet, there are mountain ranges and valleys within the planet Earth. This is a quote. With stronger topography than the Rocky Mountains or the Appalachians. And this is at the 600-kilometer boundary. The deepest we've ever dug is seven miles down. 600 kilometers, I think, comes out to, what, three feet? No, 600 kilometers is hundreds of miles down. And based on this study, they've had to update what they think the Earth looks like. Now, of course, a bunch of other scientists are going to go, no, 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 that's wrong, and Pluto's not a planet, by the way. But they're showing a new model of the Earth where we have the crust, we have the upper mantle. Now, there's always been a thing called the transition zone. But old science was that the upper mantle and the lower mantle touched, and there was a slight transition zone in between the two. And then after the lower mantle, you get into the core and things like that. But the new vision of what the Earth looks like is you have the crust, that's us, we're the tasty crust. You have the upper mantle, which goes down a couple hundred miles. And then you have an incredibly vast mountain range that exists between the lower and the upper. And, and it's not like the mountains are pushing up again. There's room in there. We can tell from the way that the seismic waves were bouncing around. And all the links are here. Check them out yourself because they'll have these new pictures of what they think the Earth looks like. But it is basically a smaller version of the Earth. We have the Earth and you get a little couple, go a couple, couple hundred miles down. And you got all these other mountains and valleys and stuff like that. The Earth has a hollow zone inside of it. It's not hollow in the middle. You can't, Jules Verne can't take his little blimp down there and fly around. Well, technically he could, but we don't have a way to get down there. And there's a, there's a theory that there's a ton of water stored up in mineral deposits in the lower mantle. And they think that if the water wasn't there, it like, it, it basically keeps the earth, like it filters up in the earth. And science is like, listen, we think that it's down there based on these mineral deposits that we know hold a lot of water. And now, to be fair, a lot of these articles were, as I started to dig deeper into it, I was really trying to find some stuff. A lot of the articles were a little too smart for me, using a bunch of $5 words. But from what I could gather, there are rocks down there, there's minerals down there that do soak up water. And there are mineral deposits down there that they believe can release oxygen as well. Now, if that stuff sounds stupid to you, it's because I misread the articles, but possibly have water down there. And I don't see why not. You still have hundreds and hundreds of miles ago before you hit the molten core. You have water down there. Do you have oxygen down there? I tried digging through all these scientific papers. They're way too smart for me. So I can't say for sure. Oh, science thinks there's oxygen down there, but there's a bunch of room. Maybe there is. Or maybe. There's not. Maybe it's a super dark place that has mountains. And let, let's not get into the... Let's take a step back here. Underneath our feet, past the hot lava tubes, past the mole men, past the chuds, there are unexplored, never will be explored, mountain ranges, valleys, caves, locked in eternal darkness. We will never, ever get to experience geography that exists on our own planet. And I always thought it was fascinating because you think, think about all the wonders under the ocean, not just the fish and stuff like that, but the geography, the, the, amazing, the amazing chasms, the Marinara Trench, for one. But these amazing geological formations that will never be seen, but at least we can pick them up with deep sea cameras, kind of, seismic x-ray water things, you know, topographical maps of the ocean, stuff like that. 
But now we're discovering that there is an entire new land base inside our planet that we'll never experience. Is it possible that there is a series of caves that lead down into there? Just connected here. Is it possible that you could go deep down enough into a cave and get your Cobra drilling machine, Cobra Commander drilling machine, and then go through and hit another cave system and so on and so forth, and then eventually get into this other area? I don't know that. But I do trust the old saying that nature abhors a vacuum. Where there is space, there is life. May not be life that we would recognize, but life. My personal belief with UFOs and aliens is that they come from our planet, most likely from inside of our planet. I've stated that multiple times. And now for the first time, just having that kind of half-assed idea, now for the first time, science says, there is room down there for something to inhabit. Doesn't mean that something's down there, but nature does abhor a vacuum. Let's go ahead and move on to our next story here. I wonder if they have, like, I wonder... It'd be interesting, because imagine if you lived... Imagine if you were... Imagine if there were aliens down there, and they had built the ships that we see as UFOs, and there is tunnels to come out through the ocean or through, you know, wherever. Most likely the ocean. Imagine them coming out for the first time and not only seeing a blue sky and humans and cities and things like that, which they'd all be like, yeah, you know, there's water down there, and we got people down there, and we have cities down there. But for the first time, seen the stars. It'd be, it'd, I, there, I don't think there's anything that we can compare to that. We can think about going into the earth or going under the ocean, but things simply get black and dark. Imagine coming up for the first time. What's funny, I say the stars. I guess I should really focus on the main one, the sun. Imagine seeing the sun for the first time as a species and being like, whoa, that's all they, that's all they say. Should have brought a poet. Should have brought a poet, Hollow Earth aliens. Probably would have had something more to say than, whoa. Anyways, let's go ahead and move on to our next story. Now, our next story is quite grim and quite odd. Very, very bizarre mystery story. And it's one of those stories where, in the end, nobody wins. Which usually makes it the most grim type of stories. We're going back to the year 1922. Let's go ahead and let's see. We're going to take the Jason Jalopy because we're going to have to keep a low profile because there's a lot of police in this story and a lot of suspects. So <laughs> driving across the countryside of France. It's April. It's 1922. And we're going to Brittany, France, which sounds like a really hot chick. But it's actually a city in the country of France. Brittany, France. Brittany, France. It does sound like a hot chick, though, doesn't it? Now, that was probably a bad way. Start, they can't really find a segue to this part. Probably shouldn't have talked about the hot chick compared to what's coming. So there is a young girl named Pauline Picard. So Pauline Picard is a two-year... I actually didn't know Picard was a real French name until I read this story. I thought it was just something made up for Star Trek. I mean, Spock's not a real name. Pauline Picard, a two-year-old girl, hanging out of the farmhouse with her family. And she wants to go out and play in the field. Now, I don't have kids. Again, I didn't know two-year-olds could talk very well, but that becomes a main point in this story. But the young girl, Pauline, goes, Mama, Mama, can I go Can I go into the fields and play around? And the mom's like, yes, Pauline, you can do that. Watch out for Klingons. And the mom is like, yes, yes, wee oui, wee, oui. wee oui, wee, oui, you can go and you can play. Now, I don't actually know if they said wee wee, because they actually spoke a a language known as Breton. I don't know if that's like an offshoot of French, like we have English, and then we have whatever they speak in in the South, in the Cajun land. Oh, yeah. I gotta stop doing accents, anyways. Pauline Picard's running through the field. The mom's like, oh, she's such a wonderful little girl. But then after a couple hours, the mom's like, dinner time, we're eating French food, and the Pauline doesn't show up. At all. So mom starts to get worried. Goes out looking for her. Can't find her. The mom alerts the authorities. They come out there. I don't know where the father was at this point. But eventually he does show up at some point. They. Actually that's interesting. That We'll get to the father in a second. But they go out. Eventually 150 people are searching the farm. No trace of Pauline. No trace at all of Pauline. And after three weeks. They're like she's not here anymore. Like, this, sorry, sorry, French mom, but we think she's gone. 
But so the search party ended like it started off strong and then people kind of started to peter out. It's kind of like when a concert's over, people show up, they're ready to go. And then after a while, they get bored. But on the fourth week, a month later, after she disappeared, a police officer arrives at the Picard's door. I'm trying so hard not to make Star Trek jokes. The police officer has a photograph of a young girl and says, is this your daughter? We think we found her. Is this your daughter? And the mama goes, oh, my God, that's my daughter. And he, she gets the husband over there, and he's like, oh, my God, that's the daughter. And the cop's like, okay, calm down for a second. We found her 200 miles away. So there was another city 200 miles away. Now, this is 1922. It's not like you were able to hop a plane back then and get stuck in the airport overnight. But she ends up 200 miles away. And the reason why the cops noticed her, because she was just wandering the streets of this town all by herself. Some accounts she was with an old woman in rags, but other people are like, no, she just wandered the street by herself. Either way, it's creepy. So the, how do you just wear rags? Do they just mean like you had raggedy clothing or was she literally like wearing dish rags? So anyways, they never found out the truth to that. The old woman either disappeared or never existed in the first place. There was just a one rag laying in the gutter. But the cops do, and the parents go, and they go to this town 200 miles away, and they're like, oh my god, it's Pauline. But, and this is where, so we just have a missing child, a missing child found. But this is where the story gets bizarre. As they start to interact with Pauline, they notice a few key things. One, she does look just like Pauline. She's emaciated. She's a little starved. Now, they're like, well, that's weird. Our daughter was chubby. You're not. You're not her daughter. But it did kind of set them off. But that wasn't the only thing. She didn't speak Breton. She didn't speak that language. She couldn't communicate with her parents and her brothers and her sisters. But when they brought Pauline home, the brothers and the sisters were like, Pauline, Pauline, you're back. Neighbors were like, oh, my God, I'm so glad you found your daughter. Other people recognized her as Pauline. But she didn't speak that language. and. She interacted with her mother and her father and her, her siblings as a child would a stranger. Is it happy? Hey, nice to meet you. My name's Pauline. Really, I think that's my name, by the way. Let's shake hands. You got anything to eat? But it wasn't in the loving way that a, she interacted with them before or a child would interact with a parent. So something was off. Now, the police were saying, listen, it's quite likely that your daughter's going to be acting weird for a while because it's quite likely, unfortunately, that she was abused. And she might be dealing with some sort of traumatic experience. So she's going to act a little weird for a while. At one point, a guy, a, a friend of theirs, apparently, named, I don't know how to pronounce this, but I'm going to say call him Eves Martin. It's that Y-V-E-S, Eves Martin. Eves Martin is hanging out of their house. And he goes... No, so Eves Martin, Yevs, Yevs, maybe it's Yevs. Yevs Martin shows up at the Picard home. And he they're drinking Earl Grey tea, hot. And he goes, is it true? Is it true that Pauline is here? That that girl that is walking around is Pauline? The parents go, yeah. And he goes, God is fair. I am guilty. And he runs away. I was like, what? Uh, Parents are like, what? Kind of weird, weird, weird thing to say. Three weeks after she is found, a cyclist is riding around the property of the Picards. And it was she, they had a farm, so it wasn't like doing wheelies in their front yard, but he was bicycling around their area. And he sees something you don't ever want to see. He sees a child's body, a little girl's body. No head, no hands. No feet, and a little stack of clothing next to the body. The, the body that wasn't wearing any clothes. And it totally freaks him out, obviously. He takes off. He goes, gets the authorities. It actually, the, the cops have to stand there for three days because it takes that long for the prosecutors to get out there. I guess they had, like, different divisions. They didn't have, like, a SVU and a criminal intent, so like that. Like, the cops would enforce the law, but to get, like, the detectives out there, they had to come from another area. So while they're standing there guarding this body, guarding the evidence, they notice there's something else there. There is the, There's a head. So they're like, oh, maybe it's the head of the little girl. I don't know why they sound so cheery about that. But at first they think it's the head of a little girl. But they go, that head's kind of big. It was half eaten, half eaten head. So you can't really tell what it is. When the prosecutors get there and they start running all their investigation stuff, their tests, 
they realize the head is the head of an adult male. So we have a little girl who's had... I this episode, Sorry, it's kind of grim. I should have said early on. But you have a little girl with no head, no hands, no feet. And then a head, a half-eaten head. It was not eaten by the cyclist. It was eaten by a bunch of foxes in the area. A half-eaten head of a man. Decapitated man. So now things are really starting to fall apart. The police immediately begin an investigation over who the bodies belong to, who the body parts belong to, and who the young girl is living in the Picard's house. The pile of clothes that are sitting next to the body, the mom of the, the, the mom of Pauline identifies those clothes as the clothes that Pauline was wearing the day she went missing, neatly folded next to her body. The police say this area where this body was found was searched over and over, and it was only 800 meters from the house. It wasn't way off in the woods. It was only 800 meters from the house, so this would have been an area that people were traveling through to and fro, searching for the body. One of the cops was like, if I had dropped my wallet there, I would have found it. Like, it was a place that they were constantly walking by. So they were working on the theory that these body parts were dumped recently. And this whole thing happened. So she went missing. Pauline was found in the city two miles away a month later. And then three weeks after that, they find this stuff. They find a head that's been eaten and a body that hasn't. The police start looking at suspects. The first one, obviously, is Yevs. So they're like, oh, so a guy came in here and like freaked out when he found out your daughter was still alive. And they're like, yeah, it was super weird. So they go track him down. He got committed to a mental institution and was completely incommunicable. He was just blah, 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 blah. And the cops are like, this, we're not going to get anything from this guy. There's, he's just a lunatic. He's a nut guy. And there's obviously, I guess I should say this, huge news story, global news story at this point. Everyone is reporting it. Huge national news story, huge international news story. The media was like, the kind of the theory was that he had a traumatic brain injury shortly before his outburst. So they think that that causes insanity, not the guilt of this murder. Then there was the theory that the father killed her because the father had a violent temper. And I th that's why I was thinking it was interesting because he wasn't there when she went missing. But now that I think about it, he he's probably just at work in the mill shop or making shoes or something like that. But he was a suspect for a while. They did have this suspect, this other suspect called Christoph Karamon. Christoph Karamon. The morning that Pauline, this is weird, the morning that Pauline disappeared, he was, first off, he was an umbrella salesman. Odd. How, I mean, either you're selling them during the rain and people are like, no, I'll just run to my buggy. Or you're selling them during the summertime and being like, you never know. But apparently back then there was umbrella salesmen. This guy sold them. So he was at the house eating breakfast with the Picards the morning that Pauline disappeared. And he was always like cuddling her and like telling her, I'm going to find you a good home. And that's creepy. And somebody apparently overheard him saying that um, Pauline was going to go away with him and stuff like that. So creep check one, two, three, like guy's a total weirdo. But the police said that his alibi checked out. So he must have been going to an umbrella sales convention or something like that that morning. But he was acting like a total weirdo and he was rubbing up on her and stuff like that. Cuddling her. I don't know. It's all gross anyways. If it's not your kid, you should keep your hands off. But anyways, so he got cleared of it as well. So we're still back to the three main mysteries. Who killed the girl? A girl. They still don't know if it's Pauline. Who killed the girl? Whose head was next to her? And who's the little girl living in the house? Little two-year-old, quote-unquote, Pauline Picard. Unfortunately, none of those questions are ever answered. But the parents say, we think that the body in the field was Pauline. And this little girl in our house was not. So, they take Pauline Picard, they take her back to the town, 200 miles away the way they found her from, and give her to a bunch of nuns. They weren't just walking down the street, it was like a nunnery, convent, convent's the word I'm looking for. 
They say, here, take care of this kid. We don't know who it is, but it's not ours. They erected a gravestone and put the date of death for Pauline Picard as the day she went missing. And that was that. No one was ever caught for this. They never identified the head. They couldn't figure out why the body parts weren't found during the original searches, so they do believe that they were dumped after the fact. Imagine, uh, just imagine that. And that there's been a couple other stories in true crime where someone's gone missing and then someone's found and it's not the correct person. That would be like losing them twice. She goes missing, you find her, you bring her home, you find out it's not her. And then you take her back. You're basically losing one child and giving up another one. The question, the biggest question to me is this. I actually have two big questions because I read the story multiple times and all the details are pretty much the same, but somebody would have had to dump those body parts. Most likely. Most likely because it was so close to where they set off the original search. Whose head is that? I think that is the to me, the big clue. A half-eaten head next to a body that hasn't been eaten really makes you think that these crimes took place at different points. Was there a half-eaten head somewhere and it was taken there? Did someone just have a cavalcade of body parts? Was someone still out there, brutally murdering children and adults and anyone who got in their way and just dumping their body parts? Was it a rage-filled incident from a father or a neighbor And they had to make it look like some sort of creepy X-Files crime to make it not look so domestic. Who knows? It's a true mystery. But this is what I think is really sad. I personally, and I have no proof to back this up, I think that the girl in the town 200 miles away was Pauline Picard. I think that any sort of differences in her personality or things like that could be attributed to physical or emotional or mental trauma. I find it odd that you could find somebody who looked like your daughter 200 miles away to the point where everyone in town is convinced that's your daughter, where you're convinced that's your daughter, except she's just a little skinny. And to spend three weeks with this person, and then you find another body that happened to have the same clothes on, or off, as the matter is, and then decide that's not your daughter. I think they I think if you didn't have a good understanding of how the brain works after trauma, you may think, well, that's weird. She's not speaking the same language and she's not acting the same, so this probably isn't the same person. If someone did that today, if someone went through a traumatic event and they used to be happy go lucky and now they're kind of sullen, you wouldn't say, Well, that's not the real person anymore. The other person must have just never shown up. That's not my sister. My sister used to be real happy, and now that that horrible thing happened to her, she sits around and cries all the time. That's not my sister. It just seems like a bizarre overreaction. There was one other theory I wanted to touch on real quick before I wrap this up. But There was another theory, and again, this was just an urban legend in town. But there was a rich couple who was due to get an inheritance, but to get the inheritance, they had to have a child. And their daughter died, so they left that body in the farm and took Pauline, but then eventually Pauline got loose. It's interesting because that story makes absolutely no sense based on the facts we have. They'd have to come back to the place to drop the body off because it wasn't found initially. Why would they let Pauline get away if it was all part of the scam? But it's interesting to show how communities and people want so hard for there to be a reasonable explanation for something that they just kind of make stuff up. But the saddest part is, is that whether or not that is Pauline or it wasn't in that in the town... Whether or not Pauline was really killed in the field or Pauline ended up 200 miles away in that town. She was an orphan. Like, they just found her wandering the streets. No one in the town claimed her as a daughter or a sister or a friend or anything like that. She was a young girl wandering 200 miles away. She was allowed to be taken 200 miles back to the Picard home and no one was like, Hey, wait, no, 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 that's my niece. Like, she was completely alone in that town when she was discovered. The rag woman nonwithstanding, because we don't know if that's true. But even the rag woman wasn't like, oh, no, 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 she works for me. Like, you have this young two-year-old girl found 200 miles away, taken to another place. After three weeks, taken back to that town, dropped off with a bunch of nuns. Two years later, she died during the measles outbreak of 1924. Just a little girl. A little mystery. No one ever claimed her. No one ever loved her. She just existed. And then she didn't. 
And if it wasn't for this mystery, the world would have never known she existed. Was she the missing girl? Or was she just a lonely child wandering the streets of a city looking for someone to care? DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at... That was, that was a depressing ending. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. <laughs>